So let's finish up chapter two and we're looking at the tail end of chapter two that is regarding motivism. So we've seen that uh, the uh, the diagnosis so far has been this sort of this big huge morality is just all these disagreements and then McIntyre says well how did it get here? McIntyre has his view that it's the result of a certain historical event and 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 largely this uh, notion of emotivism, people thinking emotivism is the correct view. And emotivism, then others say, no, emotivism is not thought to be the correct view. That is the right view. And emotivism says you're going to get all these disagreements. So um, you can, in a way, what, 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 what we've got here is, uh, was it a historical event that led up to all the disagreements and then people then put emotivism on top of them? That's McIntyre's essential view, I think. We can make the claim that people are not really reading the history right, and, and and as a historical thing, they just think that what they've been given is sort of the essence of emotivism through all these disagreements. Um, uh, in, in in that sense, okay. So what we're what we're what we're just trying to tidy up here is 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 the end of the chapter, uh, and and McIntyre wants to say something like this. Um, you know, emotivism has its problems. It's, uh, you know, people have misdiagnosed uh, the history and thought it was a theoretical problem when it's actually a historical problem. Um, and emotivism has become embedded in our culture. So, so, so the rise of emotivism, uh, you know, is largely a response to certain theories in England uh, around 1903 ish to 39. Um, and what's the consequence of the uh, embedding of emotivism in our culture? That morality has largely disappeared. Um, now, of course, you may, what are you talking about? We're talking about morality all the time. Um, but McIntyre doesn't think we're really talking about morality. There's just these endless disagreements. Um, and it's certainly not what it once was. And what was it? Well, that's part of the story of this book that uh, we're, we're looking through. And this loss, this disappearance, shall we say, of, of morality, uh, McIntyre says, commits him to uh, two uh, distinct but related tasks. And, uh, okay, so our, the two tasks, one is a, a historical philosophical investigation, and that is going to look at the Enlightenment and its problems, etc., etc., and that's going to occupy uh, chapters four, five, and six. But his first task that he's going to turn to is actually the second one, this quasi-sociological investigation, and that is uh, in, in chapter three. And um, so... So in the historical investigation, he wants to identify and describe this lost morality and evaluate its claims to objectivity and authority. So he's, he's looking at like a theoretical historical investigation, obviously. And then he, wa <coughs> excuse me. he wants to show that we do, in fact, live in this emotivist society. So that's uh, this uh, uh, second task. And that our behavior, even if we don't explicitly, like he says, even some moral philosophers that don't explicitly explicitly buy into emotivism, well, they implicitly do, right? That, that our, underneath everything, kind of the software that's running in the background is emotivist uh, software. That in everyday practice, we act as if uh, emotivism is in fact true. And sometimes at the high level of uh, theorization, as well. Okay, so the groundwork has been laid. Chapter two is an important one because it sets up uh, the main outline uh, and the contours that he will follow for the remainder of the book.